What's good, dear Dovies? A warm welcome and thank you so much for tuning in to another Deep Dove on this week's entry into the Diary of Volunteers on Earth. This week, we went animal style for the first time. It's not going to be the last one, I promise. So if you have any love for animals or maybe you even have pets yourself, you definitely want to stick around. But before I dive deeper, please allow me to do some rallying of the flock again. As I've mentioned before, Dove is nominated for the Ö3 Podcast Awards. And even though there's no real prize or prize money or anything like that, it would be kind of cool to hear Dove being mentioned on Austria's largest radio broadcasting network. So please help me out. All you have to do is check out the show notes of this episode, follow the link there, type in Dove, the Diary of Volunteers on Earth, and why you love it, ideally. <laughs> um, provide your name and your email, and that's it. It takes about a minute, and you can do it every day until the 5th of February. Maybe if we get enough votes, we'll be in like a tie kind of scenario with other newcomer podcasts. And then there's going to be another voting for that. So fingers crossed. We'll see. Much, much love for everyone who's already voted and for everyone else. Do, to, not to do. Uh, and one more thing. Due to popular demand, I will start to publish these deep doves. Maybe eventually also transcript of the actual podcasts as written blogs as well. So, some of you might know my blog barenecessities.at already. That's bear, like the animal, uh, necessities.at. And from now on, you will be able to find these deep doves in written form there as well. So, let's get to the juicy treaty treats <laughs> of this deep dove. I had the pleasure to visit one of the largest animal shelters of the Animal Protection Association in Austria. Uh, the shelter is called Achenua, which, no, I don't have a potato stuck in my throat. Uh, Achenua just literally means Noah's Ark in German. And the shelter houses mostly dogs, cats, and even horses, And they are constantly looking for new owners for their lovely animals. In the adoption section, they mostly have full-time staff, though, which is why, instead of talking to them, I talked to Margot and René. And the both of them are volunteers for a different but nonetheless super important section for the Animal Protection Association, And that is the animal rescue team. So in total, they told me that there are roughly 40 volunteers helping with the animal rescue team. There were quite a bit more during the pandemic. But since things are, at least in Austria, are kind of back to normal, um, people have less time for volunteering. So They're always looking for more people. So if you happen to be from Graz listening to this, and that might be something that's interesting to you, go check them out. And they also have dozens of voluntary dog walkers who help the team out and who just, you know, take dogs out for a stroll, for a walk. Um, so you can do that too. And talking to Margot and René was super interesting. And yet again, I was... I kind of felt privileged to learn a lot from them. One of the aspects that was most interesting to me was the relationship that we as humans have with animals. And even just stating that happenstance, circumstance, in such a way as I just did, shows an approach to life that I personally kind of have some difficulties digging and understanding. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, but 
like I'm aware how tricky this whole subject is and how many slippery slopes await anyone who <laughs> is trying to go there and how full of contradictions and and you know contradicting discussions there are if you like it or not but big but <laughs> if you know me <laughs> you know that these sort of tricky topics are also my favorite ones to discuss so here you go <laughs> come at me uh anyone who agrees or disagrees i i always love your feedback if you have any thoughts just let me know so what i think and marco and René also kind of agreed with me on this but i guess i don't want to put any words in their mouths so this is just my opinion and i think that we have collectively kind of tricked ourselves into believing that as humans, first of all, we aren't animals. We are above them. And therefore, we are also somehow detached from nature. I mean, just biologically speaking, there are definitely some factors that make our species, Homo sapiens, unique. Or at least a combination of, of factors, you know, like opposable thumbs, complex language processing, using tools, being self-aware. Those are just some things that come to mind. But certain animal species do some of those things as well. Maybe not in the same combination as Homo sapiens does it, but they do those things. And most people who aren't completely off the rails and brainwashed by religious ideology agree that we are in fact descendants from apes from animals and yet we somehow sometimes behave like we think we are gods or at least kind of godlike maybe because we have a consciousness or at least we think so and maybe because we can even contemplate what I'm talking about right now or contemplate the concept of a god and the universe and the afterlife and metaphysics, I don't know, you name it. Or maybe it is because we can attach meaning to things that at least on the surface are not really vital to our evolutionary success or the survival of our species, I guess. You know, like art or music or money or sex for pleasure i don't know i'm like just coming up with those things and actually on a side note <laughs> apparently um several species are known to pleasure themselves in a non uh, reproductive way for example uh supposedly i don't know if this is true but uh there is a documented case where a dolphin <laughs> used an electric eel to masturbate <laughs> i shit you not it um go look it up i don't know if there's video footage but anyways uh sorry i'm getting sidetracked so what i'm trying to say is this is what we think is the human condition right and Yet we, we still seem to, we aren't detached from nature. We are still rooted in nature. We are still, you know, in the same, I don't know, the Gaia uh, philosophy comes to mind that Earth or our planet is just one massive organism and all species are part of this organism. So... And this was perfectly shown uh, across the last three years or by any sort of natural disaster. We have learned, because we are smart, we have big brains, we have learned to somehow mitigate the damage and, you know, protect us from the worst. Like, you know, in Japan, um, everything is super earthquake-proof because they have a lot of earthquakes there. That's just one example. Um, but we are not safe from natural disasters entirely. There's still people dying all the time. As I'm recording this, there's floodings happening in California, for example. And we still have to abide natural laws. 
uh, unless you happen you happen to be tripping on shrooms or acid or something, then it's a whole different conversation. <laughs> but we are still affected by those things, and we are also still affected by naturally occurring illnesses, just like the pandemic showed in an incredible fashion. What is even worse is that we have built an industrial complex that kind of makes it the norm for animals to live in their own feces and you know optimize for consumption and just grow them to produce as much meat as we can harvest literally <laughs> i mean i don't know let me know what you think about this and put your thoughts in the comments or wherever before I get lost too deep <laughs> and um, go on too thin of, of ice. <laughs> Just uh, let me make the connection back to the podcast from earlier this week. Because uh, Margot René and I, we talked about this kind of human-animal relationship, uh, obviously because they have to do with animals. And paradoxically, almost, it seems to be that the human-animal relationship is both driven by love as well as cruelty, as the example shows that I just pointed out. And they said that on their daily volunteering life, they basically see the best of humans, but they also see the worst of humanity. And I can only imagine how baffling it can be when you are a pet owner yourself, like both, like both of them, and they love their pets to bits, and then all of a sudden you have to go rescue a malnourished, wounded dog that is almost close to death and has to sleep in their own shit because their owners like literally treat them like dogs. There's even a saying in our language, treating somebody like a dog which shows how we, how we, yeah, uh, the sort of relationship that we have to animals. And I guess another example that comes to mind is the contradiction um, that some cultures have where one animal is sacred to them and other animals are considered to be so dirty that you, even, that you don't even want them around and let alone keep them as a pet. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. I guess, I guess there's a word for this. Is it speciesism? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'm just making this up, but this is an interesting topic to me. I don't know. I think about this a lot because where do you stop? Same with the, the whole meat consumption thing. Um, where do you, where do you draw the line? Is it, I guess some people draw the line when, uh, animals have like, a um, a nervous system and they can actually feel pain but then do we really know i don't know <laughs> do we really know who feels pain and who doesn't and what species and what organism feels pain and which one doesn't <laughs> i don't know let me know <laughs> um probably i'm full of shit so uh next topic <laughs> uh no but seriously these sort of contradictions and and they're almost paradoxes. They, life as we know it is built upon those contradictions. They are there. If we want them to be there or not, that's one thing that I've definitely concluded for myself. Um, there's no... We just have to... Like, even despite all the struggle... And all the things that we have to handle and digest sometimes, I think the best approach, well, at least for me personally, the best approach is to radically accept the fact that there is no coin without two sides. That there, to every high there's a low and that a lot of things contradict themselves and are paradoxical. And we just have to accept that and deal with that. That's it. And most things, most issues, most problems of our society, they don't have like an easy black and white type of solution that we sometimes want to have. And 
René, one of my guests, he figured that somehow we got stuck in this sort of black and white thinking, uh, especially during the last few decades. Probably my sense is that the internet and social media and algorithms are contributing to that sort of thinking. But everything needs to be more extreme, faster, larger, higher, and so on. And that's just not a thing <laughs> concerning the relationship between animals and humans. Um, so yeah, for for him, for René, this whole notion of how bad we actually treat animals was a reason why he joined the animal rescue in the first place. Because he just couldn't stand seeing, you know, all the negative or all the all the horrible videos out there in the internet that as a pet owner you get they get washed up in your in your algorithm and you see people mistreating animals and I guess that just became too much for him. And for Margot, for my second guest, it was slightly different. But her reasoning was also super interesting to me because I guess she was the first guest on Dove who described it, who described her motivation in the following way. For her, all the news, all the negativity that is being transported in our media landscape, all of that just, it just simply became unbearable to her. And personally, having worked for a well established newspaper for the last two years, I can safely say <laughs> that she is not the only one out there who feels like that and has that kind of sentiment. I even have people in my family who say they don't want to read newspapers anymore because they are so negative all the time and they are mm, constantly being, you know, faced with with all the shit that is happening around the world. I can imagine that this might resonate with some of you out there listening right now uh some of you might feel like that um and at some point margot she just thought to herself you know enough is enough you're only getting negative input all the time and it just hurts it's just painful and margot actually acknowledges that for a lot of people this sort of pain can be paralyzing and can be depressing and it makes you feel stuck in this kind of negative feedback loop or spiral. And I've certainly had phases myself where I thought the pain is just too much and I just don't feel like leaving my bed because all that awaits me in real life is painful. Um, those are dark episodes and I'm not sure if this is what psychiatrists call a depressive episode, but it sounds exactly like that. And I figure a lot of people, maybe even most people have those sort of phases at some point in their life. And now instead of letting that whole feeling paralyze her, Margot did a 180 degree turn <laughs> and she went exactly the opposite way because she decided that she needed to do something. She decided she needed to contribute uh, so that the negativity becomes less. And she decided that she needs to start being active about it. And because, and I'm quoting her on this, because children and animals are the ones that can't help themselves, it just made sense to her to pick an activity in one of those fields. So either child care or animal care and volunteer there. And that's what she did. So, so she started to volunteer as a dog walker and eventually she switched over to animal rescue. And to me, this story of hers was kind of inspirational because I guess in a sense, this is at least in part... <laughs> exactly what I'm sort of trying to accomplish with Dove and everything else that is to come uh, on this podcast and all my content that you will hopefully enjoy in the future is to create some sort of positive feeling within people to show 
how much love, how much empathy, how much respect, and how much positivity is out there. And within people that listen to this podcast or, you know, watch and listen to my stories on social media, I hope that resonates. And again, please don't get me wrong. This is not to bypass any sort of negative emotion or feeling. I'm a huge proponent of the idea that incorporating and opening ourselves up and opening our hearts up to those negative emotions or maybe sometimes even embracing those negative emotions can be very beneficial. I mean, some of the best art is created out of pain and sadness. Anger leads, or it can lead, not always, but it can lead to incredibly important and in some cases probably long, long overdue cultural, systemic, and social changes. So those are two, just two examples that come to mind. But I totally understand anyone who is moving away from established media as well as social media because they feel like it's becoming too hard to bear. But I can only recommend <laughs> doing what Margaret did. It's probably not for everyone, but I guess she found a great way to, to cope. And, you know, the next thing is, I hate to admit it, but that's unfortunately how our attention works. It seems to be somehow wired in our brains. Uh, and I guess from an evolutionary standpoint, it kind of makes sense that we we worry. <laughs> and it used to be healthy to worry and to be scared of things. And I guess that's what we kept. Negative things just happen to catch more attention. And since the media logic follows the attention logic, I guess, it's obvious that more negative and more controversial stories are being pushed by most quote-unquote mainstream media. Actually, don't corner me now because I used that <laughs> word. I know some people feel like mainstream media is a dog whistle, but I'm not trying to use it as a dog whistle. That's just literally what they do. And I know this because I saw it on a day-to-day -day basis um, that any sort of accident, any sort of negative thing or story performed much, much better than, you know, a feel-good story or a wholesome story. And that, I, I can only, I actually hate myself for having had that thought, but there were days where, you know, our performance and the reality is in media too, performance counts, obviously. Um, where the performance wasn't great for the month or for the week. And I caught myself hoping that something would happen that will boost our, you know, click rate. It's fucked up. It's really fucked up. And that was definitely a factor why I was like, yeah, no, sorry. This is, this daily news thing is not for me. <laughs> I, I guess it, it's for some people, but honestly, I think it does make a lot of people cynical and very overly sarcastic because they have they have to deal with so much shit on a day to day basis. But yeah, sorry, I'm I'm getting sidetracked. Um, <laughs> yeah, so Margot found a way to ship around this problem, and she assertively told me that that was the best thing that she could have done. She was all smiles when she was talking about it. So I'm not sure if anyone out there who's listening needs to hear this, but I found this to be a very inspiring approach. All right, one more thing that I don't want to keep from you English speakers out there uh, are the most awkward or weird or emotional stories that Margot and René had to share or experienced from their vol volunteering with Animal Rescue. And it is safe to say that 
those stories are not for the faint-hearted. <laughs> so consider your, do consider yourself yourselves warned. Uh, René right away admitted that the memory that got stuck with him the most was a very emotional one. On like his second day, I guess it was, of volunteering, they were called or him and his team was called to save the life of a little injured kitty cat. And as they were driving to take the cat to the vet, <clears throat> excuse me, its condition just became worse and worse and worse. And in the end, there was barely any sign of life. And the cat died. And as you can imagine, it was super, super sad. He, him being, you know, a grown up man, he cried for hours and hours, he said. And it even made people at the at the animal shelter cry when they got back so i guess this sort of volunteering job or probably any sort of ambulance or rescue organization has very emotional moments so if you are considering doing that just be aware that that could happen to you as well and then um Margot's story <laughs> was Definitely more on the morbid side, and I don't know why I'm laughing. I guess that's just my um, way of dealing with things. She told us that uh, they were being called by the police because the owner of a dog had passed away. And as they got there to, you know, the scene in the apartment or whatnot, the police even warned them before they went in. So they did everything correctly. <laughs> but apparently Margot and her colleague were like, ah, it's fine. You know, we're in the medical field. We are used to seeing fucked up things. <laughs> well, <laughs> turns out that the cute dog had started eating off the man's or the, you know, the corpse's face. But not just the face, but also his private parts. And it was actually so gruesome. Or it was, you know, gruesome enough for them to want to leave again. They actually bailed. Uh, I don't know if they... I, I, I'm sure they took the dog, but... Anyway, I, I immediately had to think of one scene in one of my favorite TV shows uh, called Malcolm in the Middle. Shout out to Frankie Muniz and <laughs> Brian Cranston or whoever else is starring in that show. And there's one episode, I think it's in the first season, or one of the earlier seasons where um, the family has to attend the funeral of their aunt Helen. I think was her name. And then the oldest brother, Francis, he calls, you know, to ask about her and her passing. And Dewey, who's the youngest son of the family, he just simply tells him, cats ate her face. And then Francis is like so, so in disbelief that he's like, oh, come on, give me dad. And then their dad just says, you know, cats ate her face, but Dewey knows more about it. And it, I just had to think of that. I know it's fucked up. Um, don't hate me for it. Or if you do, um, just go for it. I don't care. So according to Margot, that dog was super cute and super well behaved. And he did actually have enough food and enough water. But apparently, it's not uncommon for dogs to do this. Or, or apparently also cats. If their owners pass away, occasionally those dogs will start, you know, eating away on the face. Beats me why that is. But I guess it's just dogs doing dog things. Um, <laughs> just like humans doing human things. And with that, that's all I have. I guess it's time to wrap up this week's Deep Dove on the Animal Rescue Team. Uh, just a quick special thanks to Margot and René for being part of the Diary of Volunteers on Earth and for providing such, you know, valuable insights and their experiences their volunteering experiences as animal rescuers 
for me personally, it was a reminder how important it is to treat all living beings with kindness and respect that we would like to be treated with, at least by humans. <laughs> I don't know if this makes sense. Um, because if I get a carnivore pet, I now am pretty sure that it will just end up eating my face eventually. <laughs> um, so, yeah. We all came from Mother Earth. We all returned to Mother Earth. That's the bottom line. Thanks for tuning in. Looking forward to explore, you know, more thought-provoking topics with you next week on The Deep Dove. Much peace and love. See you around, Jakob. Jakob.